But it's very quickly, um, you know, I know it seems like old news now, but um, after reviewing the Auburn game, still very proud of the way our players responded in the game to get them stopped, to get the ball back defensively, as well as to uh, put together a great drive. Uh, I think our team showed a lot of character and resiliency and uh, converting some big third downs and making the plays they needed to make uh, to win the game. Um, probably not one of our best games all the way around in terms of energy, intensity, enthusiasm, and execution. Uh, but we responded in the game, and uh, we have to be proud of the resiliency that our players showed you know, to do that. Uh, we had some outstanding performances in the game. Uh, Julio Jones and Colin Peake on offense. Uh, defensively, Eric Anders, Javier Arenas, Rolando McLean, who was also the SEC Player of the Week, and Javi also, you know, another really good day on special teams, and PJ and Ali Sharif uh, both did a really good job on special teams. Uh, from an injury standpoint, uh, Mark will practice today, probably non-contact, but uh, I think every player that we have will be able to practice. we got some guys that are, you know, bumped up a little bit, but uh, I think everybody will go out and uh, be able to do something in practice today, even if it's non-contact, which it may be for Mark. Um, I think this is um, a great opportunity for our team to play in the SEC championship game, especially for a second year in a row. Uh, this is a great competitive venue and um, one of the best competitive venues that I've ever had the opportunity to be involved in, and uh, I'm sure our players uh, feel the same way about that. And I think if you're a great competitor, uh, you love to play in these types of games and uh, they have a lot of great players and um, have had an undefeated season and have a very good team. And, um, you know, it's certainly a challenge for our guys and everybody should be really motivated. There's a lot of motive as to why you would want to play in a game like this. And uh, the action part of it is, you know, stepping up and um, executing and doing the things you need to do to play your best football. So it's certainly an honor for us to represent the West um, in, you know, this game and, um, it's certainly a, a, a great opportunity to play against a great Florida team who has won two out of the three na national championships, two out of the last three years national championships, and um, have a 22-game winning streak and virtually have pretty much the same team that we played last year. You know, they have 20 starters back and their punter and their kicker, so um, they, they have, they're very good in every phase of the game. You know, they're very good on offense. They have balance. They can run the ball probably better than anybody that we played. You know, they have a great leader in Tebow who certainly directs and does things that he needs to do to help his team be effective. They've got passing efficiency and make, you know, big plays in the passing game as well as, um, you know, do a good job from an efficiency standpoint of not turning the ball over and uh, being a very effective passing team. Defensively, they're probably number one in just about every category. Uh, they have good players. They have a good scheme. They play well together. Uh, there's no part of their defensive team that's not really exceptionally good. They have good guys up front can play the run. They can rush. They have very athletic linebackers that can run, very instinctive, and probably as good a secondary as you know we've seen all year. So um, special teams, they got a lot of team speed, and that usually contributes to having um, very good special teams. And in this case, I don't think there's – uh, anything different about that. They are outstanding. They've got good returners. Uh, they've got big play potential, uh, and they do a very good job of, uh, in the way they coach their special teams and the way they execute all the way around. So great opportunity for our players, and uh, very pleased and happy that we get an opportunity to play in this game. Nick, what does it say about Trent Richardson that, that someone as talented as him is able to wait his turn but, but be ready when his time comes? Well, I, I think that's um, something that can be said for a lot of guys, you know, on our team. You know, I think that, um, you know, everybody's a little bit self-absorbed and thinking about how things affect them. But, you know, the, the fine line between selfish and self-absorbed is guys that are willing to do their job for the betterment of the team and to help the team be successful. And Trent has always been a really good team guy. Uh, I know he's a young player who... Uh, had a lot of high expectations, and he's done a really good job for us this year, and he certainly met all of our expectations in terms of what he's been able to accomplish and what he's been able to do this year. 
And I think Mark has had an outstanding year. And I think the combination of those two guys, you know, sharing that position has made our team better. And I think both guys should know that and understand that and know that the competition between them probably makes them both play better. And I think that's a good thing for our team as well. And one more. What makes Brandon Spikes so good? Well, he's big, he's fast, he's very athletic, and he's very instinctive. He's sort of their leader on defense. He understands very well, you know, what and how they do what they do. And um, he's an outstanding playmaker, uh, but he's a physical, tough guy. And um, I think he does a good job of directing, you know, their defensive team and being the leader of their team as well as being a guy that has outstanding ability to make big plays, and he makes a lot of them. Coach, I wanted to ask you about the trouble that the offensive line had on Saturday. Was that a function of Auburn loading its front, or is it more about mistakes on your side? Well, I think that, um, you you know, Auburn did a good job of loading the front, um, and uh, it was something that we hadn't practiced a lot against, which is always um, more difficult for players to adapt to and adjust to. Uh, in the game, uh, I thought the players did a pretty good job of adapting in the game, but we did not probably execute and finish things as well as um, we have in the past, you know, to contribute to that. And their guys played really well. You know, they played hard. You know, we're going on silent. They jumped a snap count. You know, they beat us to the punch a couple times. So uh, all things that we need to work on and improve on. And you always learn as you go that when you see something, you better be prepared for it the next time. Coach, what is it different about Florida offense this year compared to last year's? Well, I I don't think there's a whole lot of difference other than the way they probably utilize their personnel. Um, Their personnel groupings are a little bit different uh, because – you know, they're getting two and three in there now instead of Percy Harvin being a guy that joined those guys in the backfield last year a lot to do a lot of the same things. They just put them in there and do it. Uh, that doesn't make it any easier to defend. But um, so I, I would say conceptually they do. They run the same plays. Um, they always give you a lot of multiples and formations and adjustments. Um, they get in a lot of empty and reload and – they, they, they do a lot of the things that they did a year ago. I think the way they present it is a little bit different. You know, last year they hardly ever got in regular, just regular old, you know, two back, tight end, two receivers. They do that on occasion this year. Um, so, but I think it's all more a function of utilizing the personnel they have. It's not really conceptually changing the philosophy of what they do on offense. How far has your defense come since last year against spread offenses? What did you learn in those last two games and adapt to for this year? Well, you know, I think we we, we played fairly well against these guys last year for three quarters of the game and, you know, didn't get things done in the fourth quarter when we needed to and didn't make some plays on critical third downs, especially in the red zone, uh, that they were able to convert into touchdowns uh, on three occasions. So, um, We've probably played against more of that type of stuff. Um, And I think that, you know, hopefully we understand what we need to do better. But it's still when they spread you out, it comes down to the personal mismatches that they create and how your players respond to what they need to do to try to get them covered. And sometimes when you get these guys covered, you know, 15 takes off running with the ball, which is another issue and problem that you have to try to solve defensively because – not only do you have to play pass defense, but you have to worry about him running for a first down as well. Nick, I know the, the way the NCAA keeps stats is sort of the simplest way, and coaches often measure success differently. And you talked about the red zone. Florida certainly down their red zone offense, and you guys have had problems. How do you uh, quantify success there, and it, how do you sort of explain the, the two of the more successful teams at times struggling that much in a red zone? Well, I, you know, I think there's good and bad in the red zone. You know, you did something to get it down there, start with that. Um, but you also want to finish, you know, when you get there and maximize the number of points that you get. 
and they moved the ball effectively and got it down there, which um, I think is a credit to their offensive team. Uh, and I think it's critical that last year the difference in the game was they scored when they got in the red zone. I think three out of four times or um, maybe four out of five times, but I'm talking about touchdowns. And, you know, we didn't always do that, and we need to – that's going to be a critical part of the game, you know, as to who can finish in the red zone. Um, it, it always is – you know, the multiples add up between seven and three. Um, so it's in close games, it's always comes down to how efficient and effective were you on both sides of the ball. Did you get them stopped? And were you able to convert and finish? Coach, I know that uh, Bob Stoops visited a little bit this last off season, And I was just going to ask the nature of that discussion and was it really a chalkboard session or, or just more of a just a social visit, I guess? No, it was kind of just, a, you know, we're good friends and it goes way back and um, to when I used to recruit Youngstown Cardinal Mooney and for probably 15 or 20 years and even back when he was a player and his dad was a defensive coordinator there and his brothers were playing. And um, so, you know, we just got together. We did talk a little bit of ball, nothing specific. You know, we're both defensive guys, so um, we enjoy talking, you know, defensive football. So, I mean, Will Muschamp's my good friend too, but we usually get together at the lake once in the summer, but we don't just talk about, you know, golf and the weather. We sort of gravitate toward talking about ball at some point in time. And also, Coach, I know we saw a little bit more of Ali Sharif in this last game. I was kind of wondering – the, the reasons why was that a matchup situation with Auburn, or, or is it something where Ali has, has well, worked? Corey Reamer in? wasn't able to practice very much during the course of the week uh, because of uh, a strained hamstring that he got in the Chattanooga game, and we thought he would be okay, but he wasn't able to practice a lot. So Ali ended up taking most of the reps and nickel for him. So when we got to the game. Corey thought he was okay, but we had to make a decision as to how do we manage the guy to get through the game. So we played Corey in regular, which he played in regular, which minimized how much he had to play and what he had to do. He did not play on special teams, and we played Ali and Nickel instead. So it was really a matter and a function of here's the guys that practiced the most and we thought would do the best based on the practice and that was affected by Corey's inability to take a lot of reps in practice because of his hamstring and that's the kind of thing that you don't want to push a guy and then you lose him you know so hopefully he'll be better you know this week and we'll be able to keep building on the number of reps he can take and what his opportunities are. Um, Coach Saban I have Two, first of all, I think this is your fifth time to coach in a, in a championship game, an SEC championship game. And um, how has your approach changed at all? Do you find them different than regular season games? Or do you treat them the same? How do you handle that? Well, it's really a one-game season. I mean, um, I, I don't know that the way you go about preparing for the game or practicing for the game really can change. But I think the point of emphasis to the players is it's a one-game season. I mean, we need your heart, we need your spirit, we need your mind, we need your commitment to uh, everybody trying to do their best job in this particular game because the opportunity that you created for yourself, that's certainly the action that we should be anticipating, expecting, and everybody wanting to do. So, um, But other than that, I, I don't think you can – if there was a better way to practice, we would do it so that we could get in the game. So, um, you know, having an extra day off, you know, we'll end up practicing, you know, maybe 15 minutes longer today than we usually do on Monday and maybe end up getting a little more point of emphasis to get ahead a little bit. But uh, other than that, I don't think there's anything different that we do. And the second question was just, and you referred to this briefly after the game, but, but in light of, of some of the difficulty you had running the ball, on Friday, uh, just talk about Julio Jones' game and what he was able to, to give you um, in terms of being an offensive option. 
Well, you know, and I think that um, all players need to know how they affect other players. Uh, obviously, you know, the team we played was geared up to stop the tailback. Um, and when that happens, it creates opportunities for other players. And Julio has been a great team player all year this year. Um, you know, a lot of people thinking that he didn't have the production that uh, was anticipated, even though he was injured for a while. Uh, he had a very productive game in this game and uh, played probably his best game of the year, not only in how many passes he caught, but he blocked and played hard and uh, really competed well in the game in all aspects of the game. So um, did a great job, and I think it's a great lesson for all players. You know, just because you do what you're supposed to do all the time doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go out there and have success. All right, but you got to believe that that's going to give you the best opportunity to have success. And doing your best all the time is going to enhance you to be able to take advantage of your opportunities when they come. And I think Julio's done a great job of that in the last three or four weeks. And he got some opportunities in this game and took advantage of it. Coach, kind of a, a follow-up on, on Julio. Not everybody can catch big plays down the field and across the middle. How big, how big is that? Or what, what makes him such a good receiver across the middle? Well, I just think, you know, size and it's difficult to tackle. And uh, he's also a good vertical guy. And uh, we'd certainly like to make plays down the field. I think everybody would. Uh, big plays are always, you know, a significant part of scoring a lot of points and uh, have something to do with outcomes of games. But I also think that in critical third down situations to have a guy that can do all things uh, makes you a complete receiver. And I certainly think Julio is a complete receiver in terms of his ability to get down the field as well as to run in intermediate and short crossing patterns. And, and kind of a follow-up, Joe Hayden is obviously one of the, one of the best cornerbacks uh, in SEC. Do, you, do, do they typically try to match him? Do they go out of their way to kind of match him against the star receiver? They, they can. You know, I haven't had a chance to watch all their games on defense yet, but um, it wouldn't surprise me if they did. And he is a very good player. Yeah, uh, you touched on this a little bit after the game, but in relations to the game-winning drive, as you look forward, how much can that help and, and give your team confidence knowing that you've done that? Well, I think any time you come back in a game and overcome adversity and um, put together a drive like that, it, it has to help. You know, the players' confidence and believing in themselves, especially in the situation that they were in. Um, so I know it can't hurt. Um, so um, I just hope that everyone understands that, you know, sometimes when you don't play your best and you still have success, you still have to have a willingness to learn and grow from the mistakes that you made. And hopefully our team will not only gain confidence from the way they came back and won the game, but also we'll gain knowledge from some of the things that we didn't do well in the game so that we can continue to improve. Coach, can you just describe your relationship with uh, Urban Meyer, and do you see similarities between you and Tim in terms of your personalities or the way you run your programs? Well, you know, I don't really know a lot about how Urban does. I have a tremendous amount of respect for him and the program that he's put together, the team that he's put together, the coaching job that they do. Uh, I know they work hard. They do a great job of recruiting. Uh, and in every dealing that I've had with him, um, he is absolutely a first-class you know, person uh, and represents our profession with tremendous honesty and integrity. And I have a lot of respect for him from that standpoint. But I really don't know how he does what he does and uh, I just know that he does a very good job of it um, I do know this that you know you can get Terry to tell you this story that and I'm not sure which job it was or where it was or maybe it was when I became the head coach at Toledo um, he was I think a graduate assistant at Ohio State and you know when you get a job you usually have hundreds of people calling you for a job, and now this is the University of Toledo, so it's not like, yeah, I mean, we weren't going to Notre Dame or anything, but um, and he called the house, 
and I'm, he, he might be able to tell this better, and I know Terry could because I wasn't really a part of it. And Terry talked to him. Didn't know him from Adam's house cat. And when I came home, she said, this guy named Urban Meyer called, and I really think you should hire him. I really liked him on the phone. So um, Terry throws it up to me every now and then that she's really a good evaluator of coaches, and she could talk to a guy for five minutes when we were both a lot younger and less experienced and make the determination that he was a good one. Coach, everyone knows about Javier's effectiveness in the return game. Can you talk a little bit about how he's been able to improve defensively and what kind of impact he's been able to make uh, this year? Well, you know, he's been one of our most productive defensive players. Um, but he played well for us defensively last year. I think knowledge and experience, he's gotten better and better and better and uh, understands the system, uh, doesn't make a lot of mental errors. Um, and he's a great competitor, and he's done a really good job you know, as a as a defensive back. And we've had to play so much nickel this year, uh, which he's really good at because it puts him on the slot guy and that's where a lot of his production comes and becomes an effective blitzer and uses his speed and quickness to his advantage to make a lot of plays. And he, he's done a really good job in both regards, playing corner and playing, you know, the nickel back. So um, we've been really pleased with his progress and, I think he's one of the best defensive backs in the country as well as being one of the best returners.